The following message by Alistair Begg is made available by Truth For Life. For more information, visit us online at truthforlife.org. Can I invite you to turn with me then to Genesis once again and to the 40th chapter, where for a couple of weeks now we have been saying that we are learning lessons from the dungeon. In our studies in the life of Joseph, we have also recognized the fact that here we have probably the classic Old Testament illustration of the well-known New Testament verse, Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. And Joseph is one of the cl classic illustrations of the truth of God's providence that we have in the Bible, that God, by the continued exercise of His divine energy, preserves all of His creatures, is operative in all that comes to pass in the world, and directs everything to its appointed end. There is no detail of our lives this morning that is unknown to Him. There is nothing in the events of the week or the weeks that have passed that have taken God by surprise. There is nothing which has entered into our lives as a result of fortune or chance or misfortune or fate, but that all of our days and all of our directives are from His almighty hand. This ought to instill within us a great degree of humility and counteract any notions that we may have of being master of our own destiny and champion of our futures. It should place within us a deep-seated security in the awareness of the wonderful truth that God goes before us and orders all of the events of our lives. And it should instill within us this morning, of all mornings, a great sense of victory to realize that all the forces of hell and all the incidents of evil and all the blackness and darkness of the imaginations of men and women did not circumvent God's plan, but rather ushered it in. As Peter was able to say on the day of Pentecost concerning the Lord Jesus Himself, as he preached to those who had been around and seen the events of Palm Sunday and observed the dreadful events of Calvary. And Peter says, now I want you to understand that this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. The wickedness of men was and is our very own wickedness. God cannot ever be the source of evil and wickedness. But even our wickedness and even our rebellion and even our failure, God uses to set forward His purpose in the lives of His people. And there is, as I say to you, no clearer illustration of this wonderful truth than here in this wonderful and amazing story of Joseph. We dealt last time with about two and a half lessons from the dungeon. Lesson number one was living life with a God-centered focus. Lesson number two was declaring the truth without ambiguity. And lesson number three was in preparing to die. We said that here in this record, as Joseph has the responsibility to declare to this individual that he has three days and then his life will be over, we should pause and acknowledge the way in which the Bible deals with death and prepares us for the matter of our own deaths and also enables us to speak to those who are facing death. And I want simply to dip into an area which is vast in its implications, one which some of you as physicians deal with on a very regular basis, and others of you who are involved in terminal care do likewise. 
There is and must be a Christian approach to these events, and it remains one of the great dilemmas of our culture and of our time, both for family and for physicians, to know just how one should prepare an individual to face this final journey. What should be the focus and the direction of those of us who are involved with terminal care? Now, it is obvious that the individual who faces death, as did this individual here, this poor soul, the chief baker, they need to learn to balance hope with reality. It seems to me that in facing our lives and in facing the prospect of our deaths, we need, especially when the shadow of illness falls across our horizon, we need to learn how realistically to hope for the best and to prepare for the best, and yet at the same time to recognize that we may be facing the worst. If we are unprepared as we live our lives for any event that comes our way, living as we do in a fallen world, then we're not actually living in the realm of reality. We're building castles in the air. We're building houses on sand but we are not building on the bedrock of the words of the Lord Jesus Himself. It is no service to biblical theology when facing with another or by ourselves the prospect of our own demise to speak stupidly, to speak emotionally, to declare superficially things which at the core of our being we know not to be true, and we have the deep conviction that we cannot hold God to that eventuality. Therefore, it is imperative that in hoping for the best, we prepare for the worst and do so in light of what Jesus says in John 11 in the context of the death of Lazarus as he greets the sisters. He says to them, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me will never die. That is the conviction which underpins our lives. I hear myself ringing off all the walls. If you can de-ring me, that would be a, a great help. If that is the case, as we believe it to be, then the question is how and when and in what way should we confront our family members with the issue of death? Should we, in an abrupt and unguarded way, simply announce the fact that they're out of here? Clearly not. It's neither wise nor biblical. Every circumstance needs to be approached on its own merits and demerits. It would seem to me that it is important that we will do best for those who face significant illness by reminding them of the uncertainty of their condition. First of all, that this condition is uncertain. For life by its very nature is uncertain. Therefore, it would be unwise to speak with certainty about something that is in itself so uncertain. So we need to remind them of the uncertainty of their condition and, of recognize, and recognize with them the possibility or even the probability of their not recovering from this illness. Rather than simply looking them in the eye and saying, you know, it's all over, there is absolutely no hope. For that would also be an unwise statement. At the same time, however, it would appear to me wrong to sit at the bedside of someone who is facing the potential of their death and simply to utter a bunch of platitudes, to say a bunch of biblical stuff, to trot out a lot of verses which are hopeful but do not address the real condition which the individual faces. 
I fear that in the doing of that, we do it more to save ourselves the discomfort rather than to help those who are under our care. It's easier for us to slip out a platitude like, oh, well, I'm sure that you'll be having a game of golf soon, you know, and run away out the door and get into our car and get in our car and say to ourselves, there's no way that guy will ever play another game of golf in his life so that our little statement merely eased us out the door, but it did not ease the pain and discomfort of the one with whom we have just been visiting. Absolute honesty, of course, is crucial. But honesty, tempered by wisdom and by grace, needs always to prevail. The straightforwardness of Joseph in relationship to this chap was commendable. He was absolutely honest. And the opportunity of these 72 hours provided Joseph the prospect of being able to minister to this man in relationship to the fact of his passing. I'm sure you would agree with me this morning. It's certainly true in my limited experience of these things over some 21 years now of pastoral ministry, that the human frame is increasingly alert to the fact of its demise that there is something within the centrality of a human being that recognizes that all is not well, and that there is a fading and a declining of our very life force within us. It is therefore all the more painful, I'm sure, for the individual in that circumstance to be confronted by some smiling goon who utters platitudes which both know to be nothing other than that. And therefore, I think it is best for us to help one another to face the prospect of our passing gradually, rather than to wait until the pain is such that medication must be administered and takes the person into a form of oblivion, closing down now every prospect of meaningful dialogue. And it is a tragedy to watch people engage on those two levels. First of all, superficial claptrap, followed by the entry into oblivion as a result of pain medication, and the family thus removed from the responsibility of saying anything meaningful to the individual. So we've said nothing up here, and we can say nothing down here, and we've missed the opportunity that is here. For if it is possible to live Christianly, it must be possible to die Christianly. The preparation for an individual's death, the assistance that we provide in death, is not to induce their untimely end, but it is enable them to enable them to trust and to rest in the promises and in the power of God. Yes, there is no recovery. Apparently, without some dramatic miracle, within a matter of days, maybe weeks, it may linger to months, your life will be over, and together we recognize that and we prepare for that. It is the most heinous atheism that is plied in the van of Kevorkian, who is not worthy of the nomenclature doctor. He is a serial killer. Motivated by a worldview that believes that we were born without reason, We preserve our lives by chance, and we die with irrelevance. He is therefore true to his worldview. But it does not give credence to his approach. Have you thought much about your own death? Probably not. When your insurance man comes, He never uses the word. Have you noticed that? In the unlikely event, he says, of a water landing. (laughs) Especially when you're flying across Texas, that's a fairly safe bet. In the unlikely event of your death. These fellows and girls make me smile. What do you mean, the unlikely event? It is a likely event. Or I'm just mentioning this, Alistair, in case something should happen to you. 
Things happen to me all the time. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, what I'm really saying is that if you should die prematurely, I got news for you. I'm not going to die prematurely. I'll die on the day that God has ordained for my death and not one day before it. And if that is today, then it is the right day. But it will not be premature. Loved ones, here in Genesis 40, this soul is given a great opportunity. Seventy-two hours of preparation an inbreaking of God's Word into his life, a shaft of light into the darkness of his existence, and the door of opportunity swings open for him. How about you? How about me? We have never learned to live until we have faced up to the prospect of death. Now, we could say much more about that, but we won't. It simply introduces a subject. I think that we'll come back to it on another occasion. It would be a wonderful thing to do a sort of forum in our congregation with some of our physicians and terminal care people and doctors and, uh, and, uh, and, and lawyers, and it would, it would be an exciting uh, evening. So we'll leave it there. The fourth lesson is a lesson in celebrating a birthday. If we learn a lesson about preparing to die, we also learn a wonderful lesson here about celebrating a birthday. Verse 20, now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for all his officials. Quite an event became the occasion of death and delight for these two prisoners. Notice that Pharaoh gave the party for the officials, it was not the officials that gave the party for Pharaoh. Christians, while not qualifying as party animals, should definitely qualify as party somethings. I don't know what the designation should be. But we ought to be the masters of parties. We, of all people, ought to be able to show our neighbors and our friends how to celebrate life. You see the wonderful balance of the Scriptures. If we simply are those who are wandering around saying, Oh, I wonder if you prepared for your death, then we're sort of scary people. But we can also say, And I wonder, have you learned how to celebrate life? Have you had a good birthday party lately? Tell me, how did you get on? Because, you see, birthdays in the goodness of God provide us with a unique day in 365 to celebrate God's goodness to us. Every day is a gift from His hand and therefore is worthy of our celebration and praise. But here on this day of days, we recognize that for which we can be supremely thankful. And on our birthdays, we ought to be declaring, first of all, our sense of gratitude to the Lord Himself, to be able to declare with the psalmist in Psalm 23 about His goodness and His mercy, which follows us all the days of our lives. And when we waken on our birthday morning and rub the sleep from our eyes and realize that we have been preserved by His providence to another day and the prospect of another year, we should lie before we stand and say, Lord, for your goodness and for your mercy, which has been following me all the days of my life, I magnify your holy name. It should be an occasion of gratitude to our parents in their hearing if they're alive and in the revering of their memory if they're gone. For our parents are worthy of our honor every day, and particularly, I suggest to you, on our birthdays. For here we reflect that somehow God, in the mystery of His purposes, introduced this boy called John to this girl called Louise at a church picnic. 
And as John saw Louise enter joyfully into the games of the day, he said, Now there's a girl I'd like to get close to. And having got close to her, and a wee bit closer, and a wee bit closer still, they started to produce babies. And I, for one, am so very thankful. And on my birthday, I want to revere that. I want to celebrate that. And I suggest that you do too. Proverbs 23 and verse 24. The father of a righteous man has great joy. He who has a wise son delights in him. May your father and mother be glad. May she who gave you birth rejoice. The celebration of our birthdays then should glorify God, should give gratitude to our parents, and should express our thankfulness for human friendship. Proverbs 17 and verse 17, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. 1824, A poor man, a man of many companions, may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs 27 and verse 6, Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Maybe it's your birthday this week, and you've been saying to yourself, I wonder what I'll do. Well, do at least this. Magnify God for the fact of your continued existence and for the goodness of His preservation and for all the privileges and joys of your earthly pilgrimage. Thank God for the gift of your parents and celebrate the joy with at least one good friend. Our birthdays ought not to be for us a morbid celebration of bones. Oh dear, oh dear, there we go. There's another year gone, another day closer to the grave. Oh me, oh my. We send these crummy birthday cards we probably shouldn't, as Christians, send that. It's a denial of what we believe, sending these silly things about growing older. Our birthdays should not become a morbid preoccupation with bones, nor should our birthdays become a selfish preoccupation with stuff. John Calvin says, Such is the depravity of the world that it greatly distorts those things which formerly were honestly instituted by their fathers into contrary corruptions. Let me paraphrase that. We totally goof up what was a good idea. Thus, by a vicious practice, it has become common for nearly all to abandon themselves to luxury and wantonness on their birthdays. In short, they keep up the memory of God as the author of their life in such a manner as if it were their set purpose to forget Him. Here in Genesis 40, as the unfolding saga of the life of Joseph continues, we learn a lesson in passing not only about preparing for death, but also celebrating life and celebrating our birthdays. The fifth and penultimate lesson that we learn is a lesson in dealing with disappointment, particularly the disappointment of unfulfilled hopes. The disappointment of unfulfilled hopes. You may recall that in the heart of the chapter in verse 14, Joseph, speaking to the cupbearer, says, When all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Maybe mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of the prison. A realistic and obvious 
desire on Joseph's part. He was a man. He was no more than a man. He did not want to spend his days in a dungeon. He didn't wish to live in captivity. He was confident that God was in control of all things, but he recognized that he had freedom within that framework. And so he says to the chap, you know, you'll be out of here in three days, and it would be a really nice thing if you would put in a word for me with Pharaoh. You ever ask somebody to do you a favor? You ever placed confidence in the hope that the response would come as promised? Verse 23, the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Do you think the cupbearer shot out of the prison, shook hands with the people around him, said, I'm out of here, grabbed his stuff, looked Joseph in the eye and said, you'll be hearing from me. And Joseph's spirit lifted within him, and as he said, wonderful, I bet I do. Perhaps in a matter of another two or three days, I'll be following him. And as he watched him go out of the jail, he must have said, and that's the road that I'll be taking. Soon enough, I'll be there. Buoyed by the prospect of his liberation, doubtless facing every day with expectation, every rattle at the gates of the dungeon would cause him to look up in anticipation of his discharge. If it were in contemporary environments, every time the phone rang, Joseph would be saying, leave that, it's probably for me. Leave that, that'll be the cupbearer. I'll get that. And the people around him watched as he would go and take the phone and lay it down as he would watch for the person to come in the dungeon, pretty sure it would be someone to bring the news, and then for him to become crestfallen again, as he realized, not today. And it never happened in the first seven days. And it didn't happen in the first 14. It didn't happen in the first month, the second month, the third month, the fourth month, the fifth month, the sixth month, the seventh month, till eventually Joseph realized it. And Joseph had to live with disappointment. Did the baker deliberately forget him? Was the baker just simply playing a line? I don't know. I should say the cupbearer. The baker wasn't doing much at this point. I think it's probably well-intentioned. I'll be there. You know, I'll, I, I must write a thank you note. And then you forget, and you find a bit of paper in your pocket, and you go, oh, goodness. Well, I'll do it when I get home. You get home, you don't do it, and eventually a week becomes two weeks, and then it becomes two and a half weeks and three weeks, and you say to yourself, oh, I better not write it now. They'll think I'm an idiot. And so you let it go. Did he fear that his association with Joseph would mean that he would not advance as he perhaps anticipated? Whatever the reasons, the fact is that Joseph is once again on the receiving end of pain and heartache. He's once again on the receiving end of deep disappointment, and this time it's on account of the inactivity of a man. Somebody said, gave us the impression that they would do something, and they didn't do it. And it's a source of deep disappointment. We need to learn how to deal with that. For even the best of men and women are simply men and women at their best. Indeed, Jeremiah 17 says, Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who depends on flesh for his strength. Are you trusting in man, men, women, in your business deals? Are you trusting in them, or are you trusting in the God who underpins all of the dealings of your lives? And don't let's be too hard on the cupbearer, because the fact of the matter is we also are very often, more than we are prepared to admit or even like, the occasion of disappointment in the lives of others. We disappoint people. That's why others have to learn how to deal with disappointment. People disappoint us. That's why we know how to learn to live with disappointment. What are we going to do? Or are we going to get sane? A good hymn book will get you through most difficulties in your life. I mean a good hymn book. 
And in one of my hymn books that I use with frequency, I came across this hymn that talks about dealing with disappointment, and it says, Some will love thee, some will hate thee, some will praise thee, some will slight, that is, be cunning. Cease from man and look above thee. Trust in God and do the right. And that takes us to our final point, learning to rest in God's faithfulness. For this was the only solution for Joseph at this point and at every point. Some trust in chariots, says the psalmist, and others trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. It appeared to Joseph that once again he'd been forgotten. In the same way that some of us perhaps feel distinctly like that even today. All the people around us wouldn't necessarily know. We haven't even told it to our spouse. We're living with a deep sense of disappointment. Our prayers have accumulated like unopened mail in a neighbor's mailbox who's gone away for a month, and it's all lying there. We feel somehow or another that the telephone is off the hook on the receiving end of God's interest, and certainly in terms of the care of others who have been our friends and our loved ones. We're straining at the oars, the wind is against us, and we're fearful that we're about to capsize the whole ship. And through the gathering gloom, we hear the words of the prophet, they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary, and they will walk and not faint. Joseph had been forgotten by his colleague in the dungeon, but he had not been forgotten by his Lord and Master. And nor have you, nor have I. I love these words from Isaiah 49. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? I traveled on the plane last evening with a mother and a father and the two children. It was one of those wonderful occasions that test your grace. And contrary to public perception, I do love those children and can deal with their crying. Not when I'm trying to think, though, in preaching. That's my problem. I recognize that. But it was another wonderful illustration to me of the way the mother nurtured the tiniest of the two children through the whole event. And at the end of the two-and-a-half-hour flight, to see this wee one just nestled into her mother's neck with her face and her nose all squashed in, oblivious to everything except the, the maternal interest of her mom. She'd been at 34,000 feet going 540 miles an hour, and she basically hadn't a clue. All she knew was her mom was there, and she was in her care. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast, and have no compassion on the child she has born, though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. And the door clanged on the dungeon for another day. And Joseph was alone all over again, but not alone. May his story speak strength to our bones, and light to our path, and joy to our spirits. And may it save us from thinking that men will be the answer to our deepest questions, for it is to God alone we look. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, teach us how to live and how to die, how to deal with disappointment, how to rest in your faithfulness, how to tell the truth, 
without ambiguity and how to live with a God-centered focus. May the grace, mercy, and peace from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with each one of us today and forevermore. Amen. This message was brought to you from Truth For Life, where the learning is for living. To learn more about Truth For Life with Alistair Begg, visit us online at truthforlife.org.